Marriott and Tebe, comfort and luxury at its best. Thank you so much for being a part of Good Morning Family here on Church of Uganda Family TV. My name is Carola Noamani. Welcome to Issues at Hand today. And uh, we are going to be looking at a very interesting topic. But before I go there, we are very, very glad and very happy that the LC1 and LC2 uh, leadership uh, term has been extended by cabinet. Uh, remember that we were here discussing it uh, just on Monday and uh, we were seeing sol possible solutions on how to solve that. But Today is not a day for uh, politics exactly because I have a guest in studio and uh, she is going to be telling us about the role of women in shaping the society. How interesting because don't we love the girl child? Don't we love to talk about the girl child? Her name is Diana Angwich. Did I pronounce that right? You got it. You got Thank it. God. <laughs> and uh, we do welcome you in studio, Diana. Thank you so much for being a part of Issues at Hand. Thank you for having me. Mm. It's a pleasure to be here. Growing up, uh, what were your likes and dislikes? My likes and dislikes, I think, they, oh wow, because they're varied over time. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't so confident as a child. I said what everybody else said. Mm -hmm. So if someone said they wanted to be a doctor, I said I want, to, oh. I want to be a doctor. If they said they wanted to be a pilot, I went down the same route. But uh, my likes have changed over time. I think uh, with regard to food, I liked things such as bongo. <laughs> I liked spoiled meat, where everyone drew close to ice what? cream. I was more drawn to yogurt than anybody else. I grew up Strange. with a batch of boys. So all my games were ah. boys games. So dual, going through windows, uh, climbing <laughs> trees. Uh, we, did, we did the best of that. So okay. yes, uh, I enjoyed that for a very long time. Do you mean uh, growing up with boys, is it different when you grow up with... How do you survive becoming a tomboy? No, I did. I really was purely a tomboy. I only uh, changed that when I think I entered campus. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was naturally drawn to trousers. I was naturally drawn to boy games. I was very rough. Very, very <laughs> rough. Um, still have, I think, bits of that wearing <laughs> off. Um, uh, lipstick and all the other things came way after school, way after school. And so you don't survive it, but it also messes up your identity mm. because you begin to be like the boys, talk like the boys, think like the boys, have the same emotion as the boys. And so it's quite, it's quite uh, different growing up in a batch of boys. So uh, let, uh, I'd like to ask about the confidence. Uh, you say growing up you, uh, you would go with whatever everyone else said, yeah? Do you think that is still happening in our society with our girls? Generally, yes, but it depends on how uh, society is shaping them. It depends on the family that you are growing up in, the community you are growing up in, and what you are exposed to as a young child. So the greater the exposure, and exposure I don't mean into things that are, mm. that are now hitting the, 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 the talk in Kampala, but if you were exposed to different aspects, different tribes, different cultures, different spaces, you are more likely to be more confident and able to take on the world. Mm. as opposed to just having a limited view. And so I think the danger for parents is to shield their children. They think that that is protection, but shielding children does not help them mm -hmm. in any way. It makes, them, uh, it, it makes them shy, it makes them cower, and I think the worst thing about it is it, 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 it gives them the idea and the facade that the world is easy and it's not. And so parents, as much as possible, need to train their children and need to prepare them for the world in its reality as opposed to the world that's on TV and Hollywood. Sure. Uh, let's go to, sh you talked about shielding children. Are you trying to say parents should let their children wander about? No, not necessarily. Um, you can train them and you can still give them an op and, and, and protect them mm -hmm. uh, because it's a role of a parent to protect. It's mm -hmm. indeed their role to ensure that their children are growing up in the best way. Uh, the scripture says train a child or start a child in the way that they should go. Mm -hmm. And when they grow up, they will not depart from it. So the mandate to train a child mm -hmm. fast starts with the parents and the community. You train them in their value system. What do you want their value system to be like? You train them in their faith system. What do you want their faith system to look like? You train them in the skills that they need to survive without you. Should you be gone tomorrow, your children should be 
able to survive without you. If they're extremely dependent on you and needy in that sense, you have not done a good job as a parent. Uh, you expose them to different mentors. You look at the aspects that they have as, as children, you'll notice that different children have different gifts. Mm -hmm. If you have three children, I was going to say five, but if you have three children, each of them is gifted separately, gifted differently. It's, a, it's incumbent upon the parent to recognize those gifts early. And if within the family you don't have the ability to shape them, mm -hmm. how then do you set them up with other people who can help them and who can nurture that gifting in them to enable them them become the best of themselves. You want three children or five children? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the Lord decides. Okay, so did you have a chance to have everything growing up from school fees to luxury to everything like that? Did you have the chance to uh, have that? And uh, for girls out there who don't have that kind of uh, luxury, what would you advise them? Oh. How would they go about life? I, I, well, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I did, I did have more than most people. Mm -hmm. I never ever went home because of school fees. Um, I was talking to someone recently and I said, we longed to be those children who were sent home <laughs> really? for school. No, because you wanted to get a day out of school. Mm, of and yet, uh, we were never, I was never that child or we were never those children that were sent out. Mm. My parents came for visitation. I think the only visitation my, my father missed is because he had lost his elder brother. Ah. And so he even came after the barrier to see me. And so I, I, I didn't, I don't necessarily think we grew up with, I grew up with a lot of privilege, mm. but I was on the middle end of the stick. I, there, was, there was no luck, but my mother may tell a different story mm. because when she tells the story, I, I have no recollection of what she's saying. Mm. But we, ne we never lacked shoes, we never lacked clothes, we mm. never lacked what to eat. I did not like to eat at all, uh, but we never lacked the basics and school was a must and we went to the best of the best schools. Mm. So yes, I, I did have that. What would I say to somebody who doesn't have that? Um, life balances itself out life balances itself out mm -hmm. and there is opportunity there is always opportunity they you just have to be in the right place and the right time and have the ability to recognize that opportunity mm -hmm. because the way the world works is that there will always be it's a circle things come around what someone has at an at a formative stage or an early stage of their lives that seems like an advantage mm -hmm. may also come around to somebody else who's in the village um, I see many people who are in the village and they have more as access to scholarships than me who has been in town. I have seen people who have access to learning certain skills that I may not have learned mm. because I was shielded. And so because of their skills, now they, be they, become, they begin to become business people and they're absolutely uh, business smart. And they are able to make more money in business mm -hmm. than if I tried a startup. And by the time I'm thinking <laughs> of a startup, I am in my later 20s, mm -hmm. early 30s. Mm -hmm. These people began in their teenage years. And so they are able to grow a sense of wealth much earlier than, than, than we have. And so for me, it's a question of never lose faith, recognize the opportunities that come, allow yourself to uh, expand your networks however small they look from where you are starting. Mm. I know that the world itself has a way of bringing things around. Okay, uh, we're talking about the girl child and you mentioned that uh, your relationship or connection with things like lipstick and stuff came, right, came way after school, yeah? Uh, at what age should a girl start to engage in those things? Because of course we, we are seeing parents worried and saying, eh, my girl is doing her nails, yet she's still young, she's attracting boys. For, for the parents, it's, it's about attracting boys. Yeah. At what age should a girl really get started with those things? It's every parent's concern uh, when the child has hit puberty. Every parent will go through it mm -hmm. as long as um, their children are developing. The thing that I've seen that's so different this, in this day and age is the children are developing much faster body-wise. Mm -hmm. I was seated um, at church and uh, college students or S6 vacas are mm -hmm. passing through and I'm looking at them and I'm saying <laughs> their bodies are shaped quite uh, quite sharp for that age. Uh, even teenagers at mm -hmm. church, I watch them and they are quite they are quite f filled out, mm. you know, for that age. And so, it's different from our time. I don't know if because we are malnourished, but <laughs> it's very different from the time that we were growing up. Mm. And so the pa parents are having a new dynamic to deal with. Yeah. And um, you can't use the same methodologies and the same ways that 
our parents did mm -hmm. or the previous generation did because the influence is much more you're having influences of media mm. you're having influences of community you're having influences that of their peers at school some people yeah. have phones and smartphones yeah. and uh, the latest the iPhone, latest iPhone uh -huh, actually. Uh, compared to others and so it's difficult for a parent but I think one it starts with training them as a child mm. and their value system I train them to know their value to understand their identity mm. to understand who they can and what they're capable of don't hold them back because you are afraid of what you see them becoming mm. but trust that you have trained them in the beginning to set a value system that separates them from everybody mm. um, if you if you put on if you put on if you put them into very short shots when they're coming to church or going somewhere else as children what prevents them from doing that as a teenager mm -hmm. so when their bodies start to fill out you're now worried but it's you that started that yeah. when you when you when you allow them to watch anything and to watch as much as they want or to they do, you don't limit their screen time because mm -hmm. they are going to get angry you actually get tired and leave them to watch a lot of screen time because you're tired from your day of work mm -hmm. what are you training them that every time that they're bored they should be on they should be on the screen why don't you train them to read books? Why don't you train them to expand their mind? Especially if you're not going to allow them or give, have an opportunity to let them travel and see the world. Books are the easiest way to help them expand their mind, mm -hmm. expand their capacity to go beyond what they have expected. So um, as parents, I think their role is one, to train them in value, to train them in their, um, to train them in their identity, which is very, very key, especially for young girls, mm -hmm. to understand their identity. Um, they're going to see what it means for a man to love them from how the father loves the, the mother. Mm -hmm. They're going to see how to treat men from how their father treats women around them and how the mother does the same and reciprocates that. And so it's important that the family setting is being watched. True. And in Africa where you have uh, extended families together, it's also important that everybody in your house has the same value system mm -hmm. because if you have siblings who are uncles and aunties and different people and they don't hold the same value they're coming back late in the night they're wearing what they want they're speaking whatever they want they're singing whatever they want you are setting a different perspective for your child and parents neglect that mm -hmm. and yet it's important because they're not just watching you they're watching everybody in the house yeah. and so it's important that you're also guarding that at Atmosphere, but also giving them an opportunity to explore the world. Um, so you're saying they shouldn't have style because these days, should say the in thing to wear and uh, phones are the latest. Yeah. The latest phones are what to have. I mean, everyone, everyone has them. Mm -hmm. Are you saying these children, if they have the privilege to have these things, they shouldn't have them just because? I think it's about limitation. Life is about balance and True. and finding the correct balance in everything. True. If you are if 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 someone, if your a peer at school has gotten a phone at uh, P4 and it's not your value system as a parent, hold out until it's time for the child to have a phone. If you find that a smartphone is not something that you want to expose a child to, then don't do it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take the same pressure as every parent mm -hmm. is doing. Um, shorts, when I, made my, when I made a comment about shorts, I'm talking about short shorts, you know, short shorts i don't know if i say patra shorts okay yeah okay um, shorts. <laughs> yeah the shorts that are really really short mm. i see a lot of parents bringing their children to church with very short shorts to church yes yes on sunday um and a lot of those children are filled out in the sense that their bodies are not quite small and i watch and, and say what value system are you teaching these children mm. first of all it's not appropriate for the place Second of all, for some of them, they have outgrown what you are putting them in. And then teacher, teach, I mean, there's nothing wrong with covering up. The things that are of most value are the things that are covered up. Every time somebody is, exposes themselves mm -hmm. more, there's, there's an inner child they're trying to find to, to, to comfort. There's something that is amiss. The one that is able to cover herself and be dignified is one that is confident. But then our children will get angry at their parents. If their parents stop them from doing these things, then we shall see a community where children get angry at the parents, end up uh, messing up the whole relationship, the whole parent-child <laughs> parents, parent relationship. Parents should know you're not your child's friend when you go in you when you're raising them you're not their friend you're not you're not created the beginning to be their friend if that comes over time it is a blessing 
it does and for many parents they have they will find that the relationship shifts mm. as time goes on as 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 a parent at the formative years you discipline the children that is your role discipline them teach them love them mm. care for them show them what it means nurture them in the best way you're not trying to be their friend mm -hmm. can a three-year-old tell you i want a phone and because <laughs> they're going to get angry that you're going to you you should be able to to succumb mm -hmm. no as a parent it means you've lost your authority mm -hmm. And so, as a parent, always maintain the, 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 the mantle of your authority. Don't, don't give it away or yield it away because a child is going to get angry. Teenagers are difficult for mothers and daughters, and they will have to go through it. I screwed up my mouth at my mother when I was a teenager for <laughs> so long. She told me my mouth would stay there. Thankfully, it did not. Um, she told me it would stay there for a long time. Mm. But it, was a teen it is teenagers. The hormones are raging. So much is happening. You don't want to be told certain things. You you were struggling with so much yeah that's a season that a parent is not even shouldn't even be trying so hard to give you what you want no they should be telling you how to manage your emotions mm. manage your emotions when um when you're in the middle of your cycle and your and your emotions are flaring up how do you manage them mm -hmm. because you're going to be an adult in a workspace leading and if you if you have not mastered an ability to manage your emotions then then what are you going to do uh when they get into a 20 something old then not going to parents should not treat them like their children anymore you know begin to treat them as adults as people who are independent mm. and in that sense you are trying also to parent them from a different level and a different perspective over time as long as a child knows they are safe with you as long as a child knows they always have you present their friendship will come naturally I mean the the greatest friendships are forged through going through hardship together yeah, true. and children learn to depend on you and trust you once they have seen the consistency of the parent over time mm. that they don't shift with the sand and they're able to be present be firm be a parent but also shift with them as seasons come and go okay we're still looking at children but we're going to look at teenagers and then adulthood and uh, my last question about uh, children would be what what should the relationship between God and a child be you mentioned a scripture that says uh, train up a child in the way they should go and when they grow they will not depart from it so what would the relationship don't laugh I know my scripture very well <laughs> no I wasn't <laughs> laughing at you yeah so what, what would the relation uh, be what would the relationship be or what would we expect mm -hmm. the relationship to be between God and a child God is the greatest father any child will ever have mm -hmm. um, but the first time a parent understands a father's love is from their father uh, some people don't have the opportunity to see that, which is sad. Um, and that's why I frown upon in people who choose to be single parents, um, especially mothers, because mm. you are damaging that child more than you know. I think it's, it's a decision, especially when you make it by choice. Mm -hmm. It's a decision that is very difficult on that child mm -hmm. because the first time they're going to ever understand or the way they're going to understand a parent's love or a father's love is from watching how their father deals with them. Uh, I've seen mothers train their children in this day and age and they spend time in the night uh, telling them who Jesus is in a way that's understandable for them, mm -hmm. who God is in a way that's understandable for them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's still an opportunity even for single parents to do that, to say to the child, you have a father in heaven mm. you have a father that loves you that cares for you that hopes the best for you his plans for you are good and break it down in a way that's understandable and that is good for a child mm. so that the child is able to understand that they will always they will always be a supernatural being over them and so that 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 in their formative years you're creating an opportunity for them to know who God is and so when they learn him as father he's many attributes over the years but when they learn him as father first that's a really good place for them to start then that that brings me to another question what the churches are teaching the children in maybe Sunday school is it really right because uh, one of the things I noticed is that they tell them bring the money that you are given by your parents and give it as offertory because when you steal God's money uh, it is a curse. So do you think that what the churches are teaching these children is um, correct or is right? Well, you, that's, uh, you want me to speak for all churches. Uh, <laughs> but the church is the body of Christ and uh, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but Christ is in the midst of her church or in the midst of his bride. Um, and so 
as imperfect as the church is, um, I do understand what it takes to break down a lesson to help a child understand. So we, we do Bible study at a certain space and they are, we were doing Genesis and the, and the first books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. There are some difficult passages there and they have to break them down for a child to, to understand, understand about judgment of God, about uh, discipline of God, about all these different things. So in your scenario, what the church is teaching is teaching discipline, mm. They are teaching uh, the, 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 the blessings that come from giving. Mm -hmm. They are teaching um, the child what it is that they need to do mm -hmm. when they come to the house of God. And so while they may not understand it or may not be shaping it in a way that the child understands, mm -hmm. I think for us as the church, rather than throw out the baby with the bath water, is to try and give the reason why. You know, this generation likes to ask why. <laughs> you, can't just, you can't just say, do this. They mm -hmm. say, why? <laughs> <laughs> in our days, when you said why, I, I think you slap. were slapped across the <laughs> wall and you understood your place. But um, what the churches are doing is teaching discipline. Mm. They are teaching, um, they are teaching them a way that they can grow up in. Mm -hmm. I think that what we can add as the church is to explain the why to the child, so that they are able to grow up in this, in this, in these disciplines, in this, mm -hmm. in these ways that are that are that are that are helpful to the child. Okay, let's move to the teenager now. Uh, teenagers of these days come from homes. Some of them come from homes where there is no God, absolutely, yeah. and uh, they've gotten to know to hear about God from their friends, maybe at school and stuff like that and uh, my question would be how would you advise a child who has not known God from home but uh, is out there in the world and they don't know the path the right path to take mm -hmm. how would you um, entice them to come to God and come to God mm -hmm. Your community is the first place that entices you to know God. Mm -hmm. um, most people, uh, sadly, um, maybe there's a shift in this generation, but most of us growing up mm -hmm. did not know God from our homes. I did. I had the privilege from my aunties, mm -hmm. my mother's sisters who were home, mm -hmm. to learn about God from that aspect. But m I, I find that majority of people uh, got to know God when they were entering the puberty stage. So it, it, it had to do with, the, with boarding school, with the school. So schools emphasized faith, they emphasized all these things that enabled people learn. And with a co especially boarding where the community is together and people are together, it helps people sort of build a, 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 a line through uh, the sand or uh, a doctrine so that they're able to, to see what this really means. It's haphazard when you only come to church on Sunday. And it's difficult for children also to know God when parents hold one, 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 when they appear one way on Sunday, and then as soon as church is done, uh, we're crying in the car mm. up to the next Sunday when we smile when we get out of the car. So children are watching, um, watching, and when they see a disconnect, especially for a parent who, let's say, is serving in church and doing ministry in church, when they see the disconnect between them, between the ability to serve and church and minister to others, and they see a different person at home or throughout the week, it's difficult for children to now accept the God that you say that you serve. But um, God, God in his nature always provides a way for people to get to learn him. For many young children, they, as soon as they're coming into puberty or they're coming into what you call boarding school, usually for us in our time, mm -hmm. more likely than not, schools emphasized faith. I'm sad for the schools that I don't see doing that these yeah. days and instead of taking musicians. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a place where children will meet God. Mm -hmm. The other one uh, for children is as much as possible. They are, as church, churches do a lot of holiday programs. Mm. They do a lot of holiday programs that capture uh, different people. So whether it's teenagers or it's people preparing for campus or it's even campuses, even the younger, younger crop, the younger children, they are always camps, they are always children's camps, youth camps. These are opportunities for your children to learn. So if you cannot explain the gospel in a way for this child to accept, send them to these church programs. Um, some parents are stuck in the fact that I go to this church, this 
is my faith, yeah. uh, this is it. No, I recently got a text from a classmate who is a Pentecostal, mm. but she sent her children to uh, All Saints to do the confirmation. Mm. And when the child um, came back from confirmation, she sent a message to us in her class group and said, can you commend All Saints? Because my child is doing more than just saying the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. They have learned so much and I see such a growth wow. in them and a growth spurt wow. that I have not seen. And this person has been attending a Pentecostal church all the way through. Mm. But it took a holiday program or a confirmation program for there to be a mm. difference. And so I say to parents, as much as possible, mm. send your children to these programs and allow them to explore and find God for themselves. Okay. Um, teenagers are bringing their boyfriends home meanwhile. <laughs> Uh, because they're watching movies where in Western countries it's okay for you to just walk in and be like, Mommy, this is my boyfriend. No, Mommy, this is my girlfriend. And uh, of course, it's frustrating pa parents in Uganda. And um, we say it's their fault because they're the ones giving these people phones, yeah. these children phones. And I would like to get your view on the way, the morals that uh, uh, the teenagers have developed and how we can uh, make sure that we go back to uh, the right morals, that the morals of the church, the morals that God expects us to have. Well, I think it's an indictment on the parents mm -hmm. in the beginning. If my child is capable and uh, is, is bold enough to walk in and say, Mommy, this is my, this is my boyfriend, it's an indictment on the parents. I mean, this is the way I was trained. This is what this is the leeway I was given, and I was allowed to do this. And because I've been allowed to do this, I'm confident enough to walk into home and say, "Oh, daddy meet so and so, or oh, mommy meet so and so." And um, I'm, I, I'm even missing certain things such as uh, buko in laws mm -hmm. and how they interact. I think it's an indictment on the parents, and it's difficult to teach a child in their teenage age because you're dealing not just with a child, but you're dealing with emotions and mm -hmm. hormones that are raging in that in that space. Mm -hmm. And so, when you're trying to to instruct them at that at that age, you have an uphill task. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you have an uphill task uh, compared to if you had started at a much earlier age. And so um, for parents in that time, now because the level of parenting has shifted, um, you need to be more understanding of when that has happened. So sit down and have a conversation. Uh, what does boyfriend mean to you? What, what, uh, what do you people do when, you, when you're saying your boyfriend and girlfriend? Mm. Um, what, does, what is this leading to? What is his plan in life? What is your plan in life? What does he see himself as? Do you know the role of being a, a wife? Do you know what it will take? How, how, how are you shaping yourself up? I believe that when you start to ask them these questions, they will begin to think a bit more. Uh, are we seeing an African mom asking those questions? Yeah, ha African moms, yes. <laughs> yes, very. I think this generation is changing, mm. especially because I think my age group is where, well, they are just preteens and entering preteens. But because the generations of parenting have changed, they will ask the questions. Beating has since died out, as yeah. much as possible, it has since died out. Mm. You're not going to beat the child. Um, the other aspect of closing the door and saying, uh, don't come back, do not date that boy, uh, do not do that. They can say yes to you, go behind your back and do the thing that you don't want them to do. Mm. And so it's important that the parent is opening up the space to have the conversation. Because if, you're, if you have the conversation with the children, they're then able to understand, oh, so this is what it takes to be a, a girlfriend, a wife. Uh, if I'm a girlfriend, it means I'm moving towards being a wife. And so when they understand that dynamic, mm. they're able to now reason it out in their capacity and make an informed decision. Okay. Uh, let's get to struggles of being a young person. And I would like to start with uh, what, what your experience is with dealing with these teenagers since you're always around them. I don't know if you're always around them both at church and yeah. in the courtroom. I didn't tell people that you're a lawyer. But <laughs> like you summarize for us, what are the struggles of being a young person and what are the challenges you've seen these people go through? Mm. Mm. Their struggles are completely different from ours and unique in their nature <laughs> mm. uh, because us, there was such a level of authority that you did not disobey, you did not go away from. Yes. The teenagers these days don't have... They don't, they don't respect that level of authority. And so it's difficult. Um, and because the parents at home have told them, 
it's okay to do certain things. They will answer their teachers. They will answer the maid. They will answer their, their, their aunties and uncles. Mm. They will answer. And when you see that happening, it's a bit, it's a difficult. It's now difficult for us as aunties to discipline our nieces of and nephews. Course. It's so difficult mm. because the in-law looks at you as if you are, you have, you are, you are <laughs> killing the child. And yet, discipline is one of the things that a child needs because a child that is indisciplined will never be able to manage the world that we live in. Mm. Um, and so what um, the challenges that I'm seeing for young ladies in this time is identity. That, that, I think it's, it's come throughout the generations. We struggled with it, but for them it's so much worse mm. because um, they are dealing with things that are, are an identity crisis for them. Am I a girl? Am I a boy? Um, am I attracted to a girl? Am I attracted to a boy? Mm -hmm. They're dealing with those 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 questions we never had to deal with. If we did them ours, we was experimenting. We experimented a bit here and there, mm. and then of course in your mind it, it never crossed that this would be the way of life. Yeah. But for them, it's it's become something that's a fundamental question, mm. and so it goes back to the question of who am I? Who am I? Um, they are dealing sadly in this day and age. I think it's in a more it's a broader scale uh, with abuse like never before you have many young people and because we don't talk about it it's not it's not something that we we broadcast it's difficult to talk about it whether at home I have been abused by a, by an abuse is wide abuse can be I have been touched inappropriately I um, probably my father's doing something to me at home my uncle's doing something to me at home similarly for boys the maid may be doing something for them uh, because she's not allowed to go out of the house and she's finding a, a newer COVID even made it very sad when I saw uh, a, a brother impregnant a dot because uh, his sister, sister yeah. uh, those those stories are heartbreaking and, and sadly for us that's the reality that teenagers are dealing with mm. uh, perhaps it's because we are shying away from talking about sexuality perhaps because we are shying away of talking about values mm. we are shying away we are letting the media edu educate the children we're letting Hollywood educate um, it would be frowned upon those days for you to put up a photograph with you kissing somebody. These days people do it. It would be frowned upon in Kampala for you to walk out half-dressed. I mean, people would undress you when you were in the street. True. These days people would move around with underwear. Underwear. And half the time I wonder, how, how, how is that, how is that <laughs> acceptable? You know, and so you see, a, when you see an older lady doing that, moving around in underwear, mm. how much more a teenager? And so these are the struggles they're dealing with that all stem from an identity crisis. And it's manifesting itself in this entire, in these different ways. But it's important for us, especially those who have gone ahead of them, to address this as much as possible and even the church to address this. Is it a problem of role models? Uh, in this day and age where we are seeing uh, musicians are dressed in a very, very inappropriate way on stage, even outside, and uh, of course the young people like musicians uh, or those people that wear in that kind of way. So is it, a, is it the problem of, um, of uh, role models as we get to men mentorship and leadership? Um, I think there's no one answer, no one, and um, there is no one problem. It's not one thing that's leading to that. Yes, uh, the lack of role models, uh, proper role models, let's say that. The lack of people who you can look up to uh, that have accomplished, that have done much more, um, is, 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 is a big deal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of the contributors to the situation that we are in. Um, we cannot neglect the fact that media is also contributing to that yeah. um, in many ways, because the, the story that's coming out of whole Hollywood coming out of Nollywood coming out of I don't know what those the, the ones of um, the, the the Japanese are called but it's also become a big thing in, in Uganda that people are watching mm. um, long ago some of those things you could not see them I remember growing up uh, TV was well it started at a particular time and ended at a particular time mm. but um, there are things that you could not watch my parents sometimes would watch the video with you or they watch it before you, before they gave it to you. Uh, parents are not watching what their children are watching. Mm -hmm. The cartoons are saying things to children. You think it's a cartoon and it's innocent, but it's saying things to children or it's imparting certain things. And as Christians, we need to be careful that we are not allowing the enemy to influence our children. So uh, media is also a problem for children, but also parents stripping off their ability to be parents.
is the biggest problem. You are trying to be your, your children's friend as opposed to parenting them because you think you know better than the generation that went before you. And so in your, in your, in your, in your journey of being a parent, it's important that you're mixing with other parents with diverse situations. Children go to, when parents meet together of younger children and they go to a house and their child starts to jump on somebody's chair, mm. a parent will just say, oh, get off. Um, get down and there's no discipline there is no harm that's being had and so I, and then they will break something and the child and the parent will say oh children and tell the person who, who's hosting sorry that's not the way that we should be raising our children and no so actually the person whose thing has been broken will go like oh you've broken my thing and the parent will say no don't do that to the child he will cry <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yes, mm. yes. And that's the sadness. Mm. And so for me, again, it goes back to the way we are parenting children. It's an indictment on us. Um, we are not helping the next generation. Mm. We think by handing them a silver spoon and handing them all the things that they need in life, we're doing the best for them. No, we are damaging them. I had a, um, someone gave a scenario, I think on Saturday as we met, that I'd had before, but it, it, it recalled to me, mm. it brought back to memory a couple of things. I was talking about how our some man was passing by, and you know the stages that a butterfly goes through, mm -hmm. and the last stage for them to break out of the pupa stage is to, to, to really uh, hit that shell so that it can come out and become the beautiful butterfly mm -hmm. and so a man was passing by and he saw that he saw the butterfly struggling in the pupa and so he po he poked it and he helped the butterfly so it just oh. it got out uh, did uh two like a round or two and then it fell and could not fly anymore and so he's helping it what he thought was helping was actually oh. killing it uh. Uh, the next time he, he saw one, he let it and watched it go through. And when it actually got out of that stage itself, mm -hmm. it was able to fly. I think the enabling that parents are doing these days needs to be checked as much as possible. Mm. All right. Uh, maybe let's take a very short break. We are still discussing the role of women in shaping the society. And of course, I'm still with the Council Diana. And we are talking about ladies in general, children in general, teenagers, as well as adulthood that we are going to talk about when we return. It is uh, issues at hand. We are powered by Protea Hotel by Mario Tintebe. Let's go for a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to Issues at Hand. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. We are still discussing the role of women in shaping the society. I am with the Council Anguich, Diana, and uh, she is taking us through uh, what it is to be a lady uh, in the world of today and how exactly the uh, women can shape society better. I'd like to start by asking her, who should mentor a girl child? Who should mentor a girl child? Mm -hmm. Um, well, there is no, there should not be any shortage um, of, of, of mentors, but the first mentor she'll always have is her mother. That, that one comes naturally mm. because she will learn to be a wife from you. She will learn to be uh, the person who takes care of the home from you. She will learn all these things. So it comes naturally. The first mentor a woman will always have is her mother. Okay. Um, her aunties who are around also will sort of take that same position mm. and will be and will will be and they will mentor. They will mentor her or they will show her. Um, I think the question for for those people in that position is to be very uh, intentional about it. Because you may just think that I'm a mother, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. No, but show her the rope, show her the why, show her what she, why she's doing, why you are doing the things that you are doing and how she can also do them. Mm. The other mentors that she will have will be professional mentors that come along the school along the way teachers will be will, will come in for a bit of time for a bit of time mm. uh, but along as they grow up uh, they will have professional mentors people who are the, the people who will help them in the career that they have chosen and whether it's law whether it's media whether it's uh, business whether it's uh, just even being a home a stay home mom there are people who will be there or who should be there to mentor the other one which is very important is the spiritual um this is this is one that many people neglect unless they're in charge but it's very important that they have someone who is helping them spiritually you know in the anglican church you have god parents but yeah. many people just appear for the session the of session. being a god parent <laughs> and then for, they never for show up again. i think i'm a god parent one person and don't know where they are <laughs> but they're out of the country yeah, the though. people no i was asked it was it was someone was an orphan mm. and then they got adopted by family out yeah. of the country and so 
uh, we we communicated the first time and then i mean now it died out. yeah it died out so uh, but how how intentional intentional are you as a godparent looking after this child and mentoring them spiritually um Church also does not have a shortage of mentors in that respect. So you have people who are in fellowships ahead of you, uh, who have walked the walk and talked the and talked the talk. Mm. Those are people you can look up to. And so, um, depending on what it is you want to be mentored on, it doesn't necessarily have to be just women. Mm. It depends on which aspect you are and the season you are in in your life. Okay. And uh, let's talk about domestic violence a little bit before we go to the Alabaster Ladies Conference. So um, there are cases, about 17,600, that were reported in 2022. Yeah. Those were just the ones that were reported. And uh, uh, we're, sti we're seeing men also coming up and saying that they're being seriously battered by their women. Do you believe that? Do I believe that men are being battered? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, of course. There are men who are, are, are beaten by their wives. There are men who also suffer psychological trauma from their wives. Um, they are, I think everybody has an idea when they're getting into marriage what marriage is going to look like. Mm. The problem is that we never share those ideas and we leave it in, in our hearts because nice. we think that, uh, of course, as we get into marriage, you will understand, I will understand. And... Um, Everybody is coming from a different background and a different level of healing that they have gone through. Mm -hmm. And so when they get into the, the, the marriage space, they begin to have um, certain things. And so they will, treat, um, they will treat the man depending on their level of healing. Mm -hmm. And so if she has seen a home where there was violence, whether it was from the mother or father, and she begins to respond in that way, uh, the man is going to be battered. If, for example, she has chosen not to do certain things as a wife mm -hmm. and supposing perform her wifely duties, it's psychological to the man, but it's something that she has chosen to do. And sadly, I've seen that a lot in the mm -hmm. Christian space. Um, if, uh, for example, she's used to shouting and talking back, I think the biggest vice we are seeing lately is how women use their tongues to, to cut down the men. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying it doesn't work the other way around, but... It, they, 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 they strip the men of their role to be the, 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 the head over the wife and over the fam and over the rest of the family. And so it's important that uh, um, as people are going into the place of marriage, that they are first of all being healed of whatever trauma they have been through, that too they are receiving spiritual counseling um, to perhaps even walk through deliverance if they need it. Mm. And then also that they are actually being taught to express themselves about their desires, lest you all surprise one another. I've heard of couples where um, someone is informed at the honeymoon they, they never intended to have children. And oh. so um, you find out at the honeymoon when someone says to you, oh, by the way, I don't intend to have children. Or someone says what? at the honeymoon, oh, by the way, I am unable to have children. And so those, those, those are sad situations, but it happens. And it's really violence done to the person. Yeah. Uh, but also one of the biggest levels of violence that the Bible speaks about is divorce. And so you do violence to your wife when you divorce her. Really? Yep. Malachi speaks about that. It's a very interesting scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, when I found it, I was, I was very shocked. Mm -hmm. And it says you do violence to the wife of your youth when you divorce her. Mm -hmm. And you, in, in other words, when you became a husband, you became the protector. Yeah. You became the provider. You became the one that gave her cover. You became the one that became her first and you were head over her. The moment she was saying, this is broken, you're uncovering all that and you're stripping her. And so you are doing violence. What the Bible says is that you are causing violence to this woman. So you mean that uh, even if situations go out of hand and uh, the, the relationship is broken, somebody should stick there and not divorce yes. because it's against the Bible uh, rules. It's a difficult discussion, um, and first of all, because I wear a hat both as a lawyer and then I wear a hat exactly. as, a, as a minister. Mm. So it's a difficult discussion, mm. that's the truth. Uh, the Bible really is for no divorce, and, and so that, that should tell you, mm. enter it wisely, enter marriage wisely. And so the first thing that uh, is going to help us is when you enter marriage with all the preparation you need 
to enter marriage. Because if you enter it with the right mindset, uh, knowing that God ordained this, knowing that this is for destiny and for our purpose, no matter what comes your way in that marriage, you will be able to stand it. Now, uh, there are situations you're going to come again, come through where a woman or a man is being beaten to a point that they are hospitalized sometimes, or a woman has lost a child because she was being beaten, or they have been maimed, or all these things are mm. happening. Now, um, there's an opportunity to separate for a time so that both of you can go through counseling and see if this is still a possibility. There is no silver bullet to answer this question. Mm -hmm. It's a question of what are your circumstances Go under spiritual counseling. Receive the healing that you need. Receive um, 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 what you need in that season. And people are able to uh, come back. Come back. I mean, you you know Benny Hinn. He, he got divorced and the whole world was scandalized. Mm -hmm. But I love that he made up his mind. If it's not Suzanne, I don't want anybody else. And God was able to restore mm -hmm. what had been broken. Mm -hmm. And God is able to restore anything. And that's the mindset we should have. Um, have I seen things where people just broken down irretrievably? Yes. Uh, is there, the Bible is also strict about it, about not remarrying because you commit adultery or you make the person an adulteress. Oh. And so those are difficult discussions and uh, it's hard to have them on television because mm -hmm. it's a debate and a wide debate. But I would advise that you go under spiritual counseling, um, take time to heal, take time to, to listen, take time to walk through why you have arrived at this place mm -hmm. so that you're able to forge a way forward that both glorifies God and enables you to heal. All right. Uh, there's an Alabaster Ladies Conference and this is its 12th year. Do you yes. want to tell us about that? Yes, the Alabaster Ladies Conference is the annual ladies conference that happens at All Saints Cathedral. Now, it started about uh, 12 years ago. This is going to be the 12th year, actually. And it started with just a two-day conference. The idea was to create a platform where women could mentor one another. I, I've been in church long enough, and I'd seen that then when I was serving as the youth chairperson, I had so many ladies coming to me with problems that they were facing, whether it was abuse, whether it was an identity crisis, whether it was that they didn't have money, whether it was the relationships that were happening, whether it was broken relationships, whether it was parents not dealing with their children. I was 20, what, uh, in my early 20s then, and it was difficult mm. for me, and I didn't know what to do and how to help them. A number of their situations were above my age bracket, and yet, beyond the youth ministry, there were many other women. I mean, there were women in Mother's Union, there were women in Christian Women, there were women in Ruth Ministry, there were women who had gone ahead of us, who had walked this journey longer than I had, that could help these ladies. And so I said, why don't we break the barrier amongst the women so that there are situations I cannot deal with, you are able to deal with them. And so we created the conference to break that generational barrier so that you'd have some time for uh, ladies to come together to, um, to, 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 to speak to one another and be able to mentor. Now, over the years, it has grown from just that two-day conference to slightly over a week mm. uh, conference. It, um, and that it has, it has gone in such a way that we have created what you call a mentorship program. So it's an intentional program where we have, we attach one lady to another lady and they walk with them through the year, starting with spiritual disciplines, going towards issues of stewardship, leadership, finances, how then going to practical things, how do you manage a home? Mm -hmm. uh, what does exercise look like? How do you prepare a diet? How do you dress for success? What does it mean to be professional? Um, and then all these things are within the program. So it's a full year of mentorship where you enable the women to uh, come together and be able to uh, pass on the knowledge that they have. The other aspects of the conference are wide. We have the conference which is happening for us in a cup in just on the 4th of August. Mm -hmm. I think it's next week. Yes. Mm -hmm. On the 4th of August to the 13th of August, mm -hmm. it will take place at Old Saints Cathedral. Every lady is invited, single, married, divorced, widow, every every lady every because uh, what we do in the program is 
beyond biblical best teaching, um, we have the professional breakfast. So we deal with those professional aspects. Are you struggling in your professional career? We have women who have conquered in mm -hmm. that area. So you get to listen to them, interact with them, have a conversation with them, and they will help you through that aspect. You have to deal with relationships. We have girl talk where ladies come together and have honest conversations about the relationships that they have mm -hmm. and that they are having and how can you work a way out of that. We have uh, different aspects. This time we're having teens for the first time a session of teens mm. uh, to deal with aspects that they are facing, identity crisis and these different things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And then we are big on prayer. We are big on prayer. And so the 4th of, of August starts with an overnight, which we call the Night of Glory at All Saints. Uh, so we spend a night in prayer. Uh, second to that will be the worship night, which will happen on the Friday after. So the program is packed. Uh, we are not short of anything. Whatever it is that you need and you want and you're struggling with as a woman, mm -hmm. this is the conference that you need to be at. All right. Um, how do you choose the, p the mentors? How do you say we're partnering you with you? How do you come up with those? The first thing we do is pray. The first thing we do is pray because uh, we need to know what it is and where God wants us to go. The second aspect is there's a, there's a criteria for people to be mentors. Um, for example, if you're married, are you married in church? Are you wedded in church? Wow. Because that's important. We have found that many people say they're married but never went through the ceremony and hasn't been blessed by church, despite the fact that they're putting on a ring. Oh. And so we will normally ask you for your wedding certificate if you were married. It doesn't neglect, uh, if you're divorced, it doesn't stop you from mentoring. Uh, we just need to know that you've gone through a process of healing and you're able to pass on the correct knowledge that they have. The second thing that we look for from a mentor is their testimony of the faith. How long have they been walking with God? What, is, uh, what, what, what does it look like? We'll ask you questions such as, what does a mature Christian look like? Mm -hmm. The other aspect for a mentor is, are you serving in your local church? Are you offering yourself to serve in the local church? Mm -hmm. Because now, if you come into the mentorship program, we need to know that you are under a certain level of authority. Uh, then you are able to be a part of the mentorship program. And so when we, when we can go through that criteria and other minor criteria, we sit down, uh, look, at the, look at the people who have applied for it, uh, look at the age and how we can pair you with your, uh, someone that's slightly above your age. Um, we also look at how your, maybe your careers aligning one with another in case you need professional help. And then um, with that, we set you off, we train the mentors and we train the mentees and we set them off for there and keep giving them trainings every month. So it's happening on the 12th? On the 4th. On the 4th, on the 4th of, 4th of August, August to year. the 13th of August. It crowns off with a luncheon uh, where we're wearing fascinators this year. My first time to wear a fascinator, so this should be interesting. I'll be there to see, to witness myself. <laughs> You're welcome. But thank you so much, uh, Council Diana, for being with us this morning and for being with Issues at Hand. I hope that you have learned a thing or two from the discussion we've had about the role of women in shaping the society. And, of course, you are invited. It's free of charge, right? Free of charge. Exactly. Absolutely so, free of charge. Mm, so it's free of charge. The conference mm -hmm. will be at All Saints Cathedral. Yes on the 4th of August to the 13th of August this year, and you are all invited. Thank you so much for being a part of Issues at Hand. We'll be with you tomorrow once again. My name is Caro. Thank you so much, and have a blessed day.